Yeah, we're, go we're going live. Okay. Okay. At some point, someone will have to tell me. Oh, by the way, I, you weren't around for this, but I made a major discovery. Can you move to the, your left? No, yeah. to your right, just a tiny little bit. This direction? Yeah. Um, okay. I made a, a discovery about, about audio levels in OBS. So OBS, uh -huh. so my, my interface is, has two channels, one channel for the microphone and one channel for the guitar. And then it has a USB into the computer. And so it, you're mixed. Right. Okay. okay. Sorry. With you again. Yes. Yeah. So it brings those in through the USB port in, and, and it creates a stereo track, one, which is channel one and one, which is channel two, but they are mono mm -hmm. going in. Mm -hmm. And so then when you bring that into OBS and you leave OBS as stereo, right, then yes. you get your audio on the, on one side and no audio on the other side because there's no guitar track that's playing at the same time yeah. or some second microphone. So you can flatten in OBS your monitor down, your, your audio to mono for mm -hmm. any individual channel. But what mm -hmm. that does is that halves the, it, it averages out the volume between the oh, main shit. track and the other track. And so everyone's always complaining that my audio was low. It's because you were averaged with nothing. With nothing. That's exactly right. So what you can do is you can set your entire OBS instance to mono at the yes. main settings level and then leave all the individual microphones at stereo. And it's the same thing, it's the same reason why my audio was sounding crap in Audacity, is because same thing, if you, if you can set Audacity yeah. to mono, then it brings in the two channels, averages them out. But as long as I record in stereo, then I get the, the one channel that is the audio, and then the other channel which is just empty, and then I split the tracks, dump out the guitar track, and or the second channel and then put that in. So if I wanted to do an interview, that would be great. Cause then I could get, um, I could get those two together, right? I could get the, yeah. the, I could have two microphones. Are we taking pictures of me now? Yes. I'm taking pictures of my kludge setup. That's awesome. Okay. So there you go. Solved that one problem. And now I've got a, a low pass filter. I've got a gate that I want to bring back and see if I can get, um, get that working. So it's uh, like three days before the end of the entire season, I figured this out. And now I will forget it, of course, over the summer because, you know, I won't touch a computer for the next two months. I believe that's how that's going to work. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say hi to Andy Cowley. I uh, apologize in advance. Arun Krishnan Sakthikumar. Ar Arun Krishnan Sakithumar. Beth Johnson, Brainiac N5, Ches K, Chris Bram Bamford, Bamf, uh, Colin Jones, Deep Sky Dude, Dusty Reichwin, George Lancaster, Gordon Dewis, Gudo Bibra, Helk Bjarkog, Janelle Duncan, Jason Elric, Jessica Feltz, Joanne Miz, John Suffield, John Victor, Johnny J, jo sorry, Johnny Zed, Jonathan Fortney, Kevin N, Kylie Serna, Linda Sadiq, Luke Duke, best name, that's awesome. Magnus, if that's like your real name, that is so good. Uh, Magnus Thimer Jensen, Mr. Tom Harbin, Miss Brick Kitten, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B, Paranor, Paul Gracie, Sergusi, So Reels and Tropia Univor Universe, also a great name. Susan Murph, Therion, Thomas Tranaker, Tom Van Scotter, Umu, YT Viewer, I'm assuming that's YouTube Viewer. Yeah. Uh, Zapfin, Zapfin. Hey, everybody, and a whole bunch of new people today. Welcome. Uh, welcome, welcome to this very sp special episode of Astronomy Cast. Oh, We're like randomized episodes. I loved Cast. the essay, the talk that you're going to be giving. I read the script to the talk that you're going to be giving about sort of the history. And the oh, I gave it yesterday. Oh, you did. Okay, uh, great. Yeah. Uh, can I repost that on Universe Today? I, I want to make one edit real fast, and yeah, I'll let you know as soon as you can post okay. it. Okay, yeah, I'll just I was just going to copy paste from that, but to see yeah. that original, the napkin, well, the bar tab where we laid out yes. the, it's I'm amazed that you kept it and you have pictures of it. Oh, it's on it. my bulletin board. Yeah, it's so great. Um, yeah, 
which I think was is so great that we hammered out all the, the the idea and and then you have just Built been it. grinding to build it and yeah. and it and it feels Works. It works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I but it feels it feels closer now than I think it's ever felt with the work that you're doing with the respect that you're getting through Cosmo Quest with the um, with new the, institution. With the, yeah, the with the family totally you found at, at at the Planetary Science Institute. Yeah. Uh, and all of that. So again, just like congratulations to everything you've Thank been doing. You. Uh, I know it's just been pain and misery um, for huge chunks of it. Yes. But it really shows how well you've been able to stick to something and see it through and make a meaningful difference to the world. So I am one of your biggest fans. And I think hopefully everybody watching kind of knows how I feel about how hard you've been working and what you've accomplished. And uh, now you've got the uh, Isaac Asimov Humanity Prize to uh, to go along with yeah. all of our warm wishes. So uh, yeah. I can't wait to see what you accomplish next. It's it's been a wild ride and I'm just so glad you've been there all along the lines to push me in new directions. Ev everyone needs that ally to be their cheerleader, to support them on and to call them on their shit. And <laughs> you've been there. All right. Uh, let's get into today's I'm episode. I'm grabbing my soda first. Okay. All right. I'm sitting on a super deep sofa that is determined to eat me. Yeah. And I people if ever sat on a sofa where it's just like, I will never stand up again. Uh, and, and I, I, I can't wait to see the picture of the, just the shenanigans that you've gone to, to try and get this computer at roughly, it looks like it's like a little uneven, but you have no idea what she had to do to make this <laughs> go so um oh but i that i'm gonna have to do a, a special picture of i posted two pictures but it doesn't catch the glory of the origami that went into getting my camera level yeah that's awesome um all right uh so if you're wondering what it is that you've stumbled into this is of course the final episode of astronomy cast before we go on to our hiatus our two-month hiatus that mm, said final recorded not at joshua tree right well and that's exactly what i was about to go into which yeah. is that we will be uh, dropping additional audio nuggets of goodness from the various conversations which we are absolutely going to be having at joshua tree so that you can be a fly on the wall if you weren't able to join us for the live event you'll be able to get um you'll be able to hear some of the cool conversations that we have so uh stay tuned there'll be more um, hey, happy solstice. Happy solstice. So for me, solstice is always a little bit bittersweet because it means the sun is going to start going away yeah. and it's going to get stupidly hot. Yeah. And I dislike both those things. Yeah. Um, um, it still, it blows Carla's mind every time the solstice rolls around here in Canada because really? it's like oh, 1030 yeah. no, and it's still <laughs> light out, right? And she yeah. just like can't wrap her head around why it's still so bright, even though it's still so late. And yeah. also she has forgotten the horrible nightmare of in the winter time when it is so dark so early yeah so yeah that's canada anywhere in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere closer to the poles yeah all right tell me when you are ready to go um i'm in the process of trying to figure out how i have so many pieces of software open simultaneously have you ever just like looked at what all you have open and questioned? Well, every couple of days, Windows does an update and just makes that problem go away for me. So I, who knows what beautiful work I've lost because Windows <laughs> is just like, those tabs, you don't need them. I don't care what you had going. Start with a clean slate. And somehow I forget. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm able to, I forget what I was working on. I'm able to just start afresh. Yeah, all those articles on why this TV show is yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah they're all yeah, gone. Exactly. I'm yeah, that's all gone. Them. No, no, no. I like like when I write a script, I I oh, put out tabs. twenty yeah. tabs, right? Which is like all little pieces of research that I'm trying to bring together, and mm -hmm. then yeah, gone. Yes. Have yeah. To start again. Max are kinder. Right, but I but I think that we need that to to remove the cruft from our lives. So thank it's, you, it's true. Windows. 
Okay, I am ready to press record. Okay. I have pressed record. As... Oh, no, everything went sideways. Okay, that's bad. Fixing. Okay, sorry, it was just like, that's not the right mic and I hear myself twice now. Okay, I'm pressing record again. Okay, I'm also pressing record. We are recording. It works. Yay, we did Thank it. Thank you, Susie. Astronomy Cast, episode 535, Astronomy Events This Summer. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Um, we are, this is it. This is the final yeah. episode of season 11 before we go on to our summer hiatus. Um, but don't worry, we are going to be doing a bunch of cool events at Joshua Tree. And there will probably be other stuff that we will throw into the astronomy cast feed. So you can be a fly oh, on yeah. the wall at the event if you weren't able to make it in person. And um, so we'll, and then other stuff is still gonna be happening. You're still doing daily space. I'm still doing the guide to space still doing my question shows. And um probably a lot more live telescope streaming so it's gonna be a lot of good stuff this summer still just the ones that require us to find our way to high speed internet every two days all the time that's the one that we will be uh that we'll be putting on hiatus so that we can go and have some semblance of a life yeah yeah and i don't know about you but like for the united states fourth of july and you guys have your own independence day the same week um I'm totally taking that week off. All of our streams on CosmoQuest are going down. Um, sometimes you just need to get away from the internet. Yeah, so actually the plan is I'm going to be going to the Joshua Tree meeting and then uh, Carla and I are going to be driving back from California. She's already down there. Oh, wow. And we're gonna be driving back from California uh, back through like central California through like Yosemite and yeah. visiting a bunch of people on our way back up up the coast so uh, it may be that uh, I could be convinced if you're anywhere in that area to stop by for a beer so uh, just beep boot me on Facebook or whatever and uh, and I'm sure we'll or who uses Facebook Twitter, whatever reach out to me you can find me and uh, I'll try and uh, try and meet up with people on my way back to Canada and this is a really good transition to our show because the next thing I want to say, I should wait till you've done our intro. Okay. <laughs> it's summertime and time for our annual astronomy cast hiatus, but this doesn't mean that the astronomy adventure has to end. Today, we'll give you some tips and tricks for astronomy summer adventures. All right, Pamela, uh, what do you got planned? What's, what's, what's happening astronomy wise this summer? So we, we are at a special time in astronomy where we know that the mega constellations are coming, but they're not yet here. And so we have this brief window where we can still safely capture star trails, capture the sky moving over our favorite landscapes and city skylines. And I, at Joshua Tree, am planning to capture all possible sky trails, star trails, seeing everything in motion before those constellations rain down uh, internet upon our heads. So, so you're uh, talking about like Starlink and the various satellite constellations. Ah, I see what you're driving yeah, at, right? As yeah. opposed to, as opposed to when I think about the mega constellations, something like Sagittarius and no, maybe Scorpio. No, those are always there. Oh, okay. uh, sometimes right. they're below our feet. Yes. But, uh, yeah. No, I'm worried about as we start to get thousands of satellites that are on these summer nights reflecting starlight down, not starlights, well, it is a star, reflecting our suns, the nearest star's light down at us. It's gonna get really hard to get these beautiful, pristine star trails that just show how the stars as the world turns move through our sky. Um, because if, if you're subtracting out all the images that have a satellite in them, you're gonna end up with dashed lines. Yes. Uh, so, so you're proposing that people perhaps uh, take it upon themselves to do a star trail photograph. Yes, yes. So what do you need to be able to do a star trail? 
You need some sort of a camera that lets you take very long exposures and you need a tripod. And if you really like yourself, you're gonna find uh, some software that you can install on your camera or you're gonna figure out from your instruction manual the mode to put your camera in where it will just take image after image after image. Yep. And that's what you do is you set your camera to leave no gaps between the images, just flash the shutter open and close, take as long an exposure as you can take with your camera before you start to get a lot of noise in the image. If you leave your camera open too long, you're going to catch a ton of cosmic rays. Your chip is going to heat up and you're going to end up with, instead of a black sky, it's going to look like just, really bad noisy junk right so like this idea of doing a star trail you you i mean 30 seconds most cameras most dslr cameras will do like a 30 second exposure if you can go longer than that like a one minute exposure is probably okay depending on how much light pollution you have in your area how much sky glow is going on then it may start to wash over the the colors and so the key to doing a star trail is to just take a picture, take a lot of pictures. And so it's about the timing that you get right. It's about, and either like a lot of the modern cameras, I don't know about yours, but like my Lumix will just do this automatically. Yes. You can, there's a setting. Yeah. Um, Some of the older Canons won't do it, but if you've got like an older Canon, Mm -hmm. you can get a piece of software called um, Magic Lantern and it will give you that capability. Or you can buy a, a piece of hardware called an intervalometer And that will do the trick as well. It'll essentially pull the the shutter every minute and take a one minute picture and then do it again and then do it again. And the key is to just get all that data. And if it's slightly windy, weigh your tripod down. One of the things that I've done is my backpack has a carabiner on the handle that's at the top of a lot of backpacks. And I can attach that carabiner to the bottom of my tripod and the weight of my backpack means my tripod is going nowhere in windy circumstances. And this will give you a rock solid base to get beautiful images of the sky while we still can. So do the thing, people. Do the thing and share the pictures with us. Well, and the thing that I really love about doing star trails is that you don't need to have a very precisely targeted mount. You don't need to track the sky. Uh, star trailing, the the natural star trailing that happens, now this is playing in your favor and it creates these beautiful pictures. And if you can do it with some kind of of foreground object, that's great. The longer you have the the time to do it, the longer the trails you'll get. Um, And you get to really see the colors of the stars because they'll leave these white trails or these blue trails or these yellow red trails you really get a sense in a way that you can't necessarily if you take a picture. So there you go. If you have a DSLR and you want, surprisingly, the star trails are the are the one of the first and easiest kinds of pictures to take. But yes. let's say you do have a DSLR and you want to take another kind of picture, say of the Milky Way, what should you do? Well, if you don't have a steerable tripod, Uh, You're going to need to take shorter exposures. If you're zoomed in a lot, don't do anything more than 10 seconds. If you're zoomed out so that you can get a big swath of the Milky Way, you can start to go to 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, Take one or two images, pop out your chip, blow them up on a computer, see how bad you're trailing. Uh, Now, here, if you're going to try and combine your images later and you don't have a tripod, make sure you have no trees, no <laughs> buildings, no landscape. And there's software out there that will let you combine all your yep. photos later and it will artifact artificially track for you. Yeah. So, I mean, this idea of taking a picture of the Milky Way, like if you just want to take one photo of the Milky Way, your first mm-hmm. introductory shot of the Milky Way, right. then set up your camera you need to crank the aperture of your camera wide open. So the whatever is the lowest number F stop your camera will go, you want to turn open your shutter all the way you want. That's Yeah, well, you you want to make your exposure, say, whatever is the longest you can do to get no star trailing. And that just depends on the on the the lens that you have. So it might be that you, you know, like, I've got a 14 millimeter lens, 
and it will let me do a 30 second exposure, no problem, yeah. no star trailing. But I have a um, like a 70 millimeter lens and it will start to star trail after about 10 seconds. Right. So, or I have a, yeah, so just like, like, and the stock lens that will come with your camera. The thing you want the most is the fastest lens. So if you've yes. got like a 50 millimeter lens with a 1.4 F aperture, Use that's that. perfect. Don't try to get away from the, the regular lens that comes with your, with your camera. If it's, if it's, cause it'll have like an F 4.5 or an F five. So it's very slow. Um, right. And then. ISO, you're going to want to set it to 3200 or 6400 that gets a little noisy and then just practice and play. Yeah. And if you still have a film camera, uh, here you want to actually use um, a lower number than 3200 because that's way too noisy. You will regret all your life choices. Get something around 400 and just leave your camera open all night long. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, let's, I mean, this whole show isn't going to be about astrophotography. No. I mean, there's going to be some, no. some other events. So, uh, you, you know, if, if you enjoyed either of those things, then you can start down the rabbit hole of astrophotography. And we've done whole shows on this and yep. we're happy to give more advice, but, but that's where you start. Take that nice picture of the Milky Way and you'll be so happy with what you did. There is, you know, surprisingly easy to get an amazing picture if you go to dark skies. Yes. So I think we can segue into go find yourself some dark skies. Yeah. And, and June 23rd, just a couple days from now, uh, I think this show goes live on June 23rd. If I'm mathing, if I'm not, I apologies to everyone who is hearing this after the fact. Uh, June 23rd, Mercury is at its greatest elongation from the sun. This means it's the furthest distance it's going to get from the sun in our sky. And that's the best time to go out and try and catch a look at it. It's going to be 25.2 degrees from the sun. And... Um, Go outside just after sunset and look for a small bleep of light hanging out. And if it's after June 23rd, it's still there. It's just working its way back closer and closer to the sun. So you've got some time. Mercury is the hardest nearby planet to see because it is always washed out by all that sunlight. And it's a small world. Amazingly, I had never seen Mercury with my own eyes until last summer. Because, really? well, because where I live, we have mountains to the west and mountains to the east uh, across the, across, and it's, in, and the sort of the low elevation in the sky, it's pretty murky and it's really hard to see things. And so, so I've never been, I've never been able to see Mercury off to the west after sunset. It was finally when I was in Australia where, where Mercury rises up perpendicular to the horizon that I could finally make it out, which was kind of incredible. So it's a real challenge. You need that nice clean view to the, to the West after yeah. sunset and just wait for a star to appear and then it's gone, but you did it, but that's not the only planet. I mean, Mercury's great, but right. Jupiter is astonishing right now that you're yes. listening to this. And, and so this summer, Jupiter is in the process of uh, being closer to the Earth than it normally is. On June 10th, it was at great opposition. This means that on June 10th, in the past, yep. it went Sun, Earth, Jupiter in a straight line in our solar system. Now, Jupiter moves really slow across the sky, and it's the Earth's, do it's the Earth's motion that's dominating the situation. But Jupiter is still gloriously bright through a telescope. It's bigger than it normally is. It's still tiny, but you can see the stripey bits. You can see the moon. Go outside. Take a look at Jupiter. It's cool. And then go on the web, look at Juno Cam, and um, just comparing what you can see with your eyes, what the spacecraft can see, and then letting your imagine go, imagination go wild is a fun thing to do. And when it's this close, you can even see it in a pair of binoculars. You yes. can see the moons yeah. in, the, in a pair of binoculars. So it's just like yeah. the perfect time to look at Jupiter during, during opposition. And every day that goes by, it's going to get a little worse. So if go now. Have, go now. Uh, if you have a telescope, great. Uh, if you don't, take a pair of binoculars. 
Uh, let's say a person wants to make a last minute uh, telescope purchase to have some fun this summer with some of the things. What should they get? I, it all depends on what you want to do. I talk to the good folks at Oceanside Photo and Telescope. If you just want to look at things by eye and slew around the sky, get yourself uh, one of these basically light buckets of, of a... Um, yeah, like an eight-inch Dobsonian. That's the word I lost, yeah. an eight-inch Dobsonian. I, I'd get the biggest Dob that you can both afford and pick up. If you have a telescope that you can't easily move, you're not going to get into the hobby. So he says eight-inch. I'd say six-inch for me because that's okay, the one I okay. plug around. Yeah, I thought you were going to go go bigger. But not like, for a Dob. Yeah, yeah, not for a Dob. I mean, the thing is, is like a 10-inch Dobsonian is better than an eight-inch Dobsonian, has yes. better optics, et cetera, but it's just less luggable. And so, and really the whole key with the Dobsonian is it's, you see something in the sky and you go, what's that? And then you set up the Dobsonian, you slew really quickly and you go, ah, it's yeah. Saturn. Yeah. Sp and, and they're just fun. And it's, it's how you learn the sky because while you can buy them that have these little arrow systems on that, on them that you say, I want to go look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is a summertime object. It's up in the middle of the night. Uh, it will give you arrows to help you slew over, slew up, find the object. Uh, but then it starts to become memory of this is how you get there. If you have one of the completely automated telescopes, they're great for doing photography, um, a nice schmidt cassegrain telescope. I'm partial to the ones by Celestron. internet clearly cracked so, out okay sorry about that um it's okay your internet it, you just cut out but i'm sure Susie can fix this you can fix it yeah. Susie. uh so a good schmidt cascarian telescope mounted on a drive system will let you do great photography will let you start to do science but you're not gonna learn the sky because you're just typing yep. in where you go and it's gonna steer for you and so, yeah, and if and like if you haven't bought a Dobsonian and you haven't taken it out and taught yourself the sky and brought it out on several occasions and spent a lot of time, then then you do not have our permission to buy a fancier telescope. So Dobsonian first. This is the deal. But, yes. And and in fact, you're lucky we'll even let you buy a Dobsonian when you really need to start with a nice pair of astronomical binoculars. But that's true. But both of them are like the astronomical binoculars. They're amazing to see the the Milky Way and some and some of the brighter features. But you can't see the rings of Saturn and you can't see right. the moons of Jupiter very well and the bands across the planet. So, so really, both of those are are great. Yeah, and and this summer the number of cool objects that are out. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the asteroid palace, the asteroid. Uh, uh, my brain is not, sorry, Susie, you're going to have edits to make. Uh, we have the, the asteroid palace. We have the asteroid Vesta, both making appearances that you can easily see them with small telescopes. Uh, we have a, a total solar eclipse in July if you're in narrow, tiny band through yeah. South America. But it's a great night for all of us to go out because there's no moon. Uh, Saturn on July 9th is going to, well, follow in the footsteps of Jupiter. It's going to be at greatest opposition, lined up, Sun, Earth, Saturn. Uh, there's meteor showers. And I don't know about you, but some of my first memories are seeing these summer meteor showers and just getting to stay up super late because there was no school and trying to count, count them and sketch where they were coming from in the sky. The, and, uh, the problem with the meteor shower this summer, the Perseid meteor shower is, yeah. the, is the big one. And There's that's a moon. The, yeah. So, so you're going to see that peak on August 13th, but you're exactly right. We've got a almost full moon during the height of the Perseid meteor shower, which just sucks. So yeah. this is not your year to organize your friends, go out to some cool dark sky location and watch the Perseid meteor shower on the peak of the shower. But, but you can the Delta Aquarids a week or so earlier are a wussier shower. It's not as exciting. Yeah. 
but it has a dark sky and with Saturn at opposition and Jupiter creeping away slowly, I'd say go go give the Delta Aquarids a chance. They they don't get all the attention of the Perseids, but they're timed yeah. for a better moon this year. Well, the 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 Perseids really they start on the 23rd of July and they wrap yeah. up around the 20th of August. So you've really got almost a full month. So this summer, like normally go on the height, the day of the height of the Perseid meteor shower. But this summer, since since you've got this moon and the moon is a killer, I would yeah. push it a week about a week back, like whatever is the weekend before that moon. So like around the sixth, seventh, you're going to have almost mm -hmm. no moon, the moon is going to go down right. shortly after sunset. And then you're going to have a nice dark sky, it's going to be warm in the northern hemisphere and you're going to have a chance to be able to watch this with your with your friends and family. I still think it's and and even on any night lay laying out watching the sky, you will see meteors. So yes, you see and, more uh, during the Perseids, but you'll still see them. And there's also going to be a cool night for seeing the moon come the moon go and a uh, potentially cool red shadow in between. On July 16th, there's going to be a partial lunar eclipse, not here in the Americas, we are in entirely the wrong place. We had our shot. We, we did, yeah. we did. Uh, but for those of you in Europe, Africa, Central Asia, uh, Indian Ocean, you're going to have on July 16th, a partial lunar eclipse. And this makes sense since we have the solar eclipse, next full moon, there's, there's usually going to be the moon ducking into a shadow, right? They go in pairs. So you get yeah. lunar eclipses and solar eclipses one after the other, usually because of the way the alignment between the, the earth and the and the moon as they go around the sun. Uh, what else will people be able to see this summer? Well, those are the big special events. But because it's summer, uh, the sky is pretty special in general, even without all this cool stuff going on. As you already talked about, we have the Milky Way pretty much as high in the sky as it's going to get for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. It passes through the Great Summer Triangle, which is a combination of three different constellations. And if you can identify Cygnus the Swan, Cygnus the Swan is flying along that Milky Way. Uh, not too far away is Vega and a gorgeous little nebula over there in Lyra. Um, it's just a cool year to get out and see what all is in the sky. Now, my favorite is uh, finding Andromeda because it's both a super hard challenge because you can star hop there from the legs of the constellation Pegasus. Follow the right leg out, jump a couple of stars. Yep. You Two have stars yourself. up and a little bit over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then once you find it, it's just the, oh, that is a galaxy. And you can see it if you're in a dark enough sight with your eyeballs oh, yeah. without binoculars or anything else. And this is, for those of us living in the Northern Hemisphere, the only object not in our galaxy that we can see with our eyeballs. So go say, I've seen another galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Andromeda is is a great challenge. And it's, it's like each one of these objects, once you learn to find it, you will always be able to find it. I mean, I hope some of the people who are listening here were with us on the cruise last summer. And I taught yes. everybody who was willing, uh, I taught them all how to find Andromeda, and, and then everybody was able to find it. And my hope is, is that this is something that they've gone and remembered and been able to every time they want go find the stars, make the connections and find that that galaxy because it is it's always in the same place when you see Pegasus rise, Andromeda is there with it. And for galaxies in general, this is a great time of year if you've got a scope. M51, which is that beautiful whirlpool galaxy that has a nearby spud hanging off of it, giving it its grand design. Design, mm -hmm. uh, It's visible in the early evening. We have Sagittarius early in the morning, bringing us the center of our galaxy. And the wealth of star clusters, of nebulae, all these different objects, the night is short. It's warm. Mm -hmm. There's mosquitoes. We're bug repellent. We like you. Please do not get sick. Uh, 
those few hours, there's so many things that you can catch and watch during that time. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to set up a hammock with binoculars, leave my camera doing its star trail thing or whatever else I want to have it doing. Um, so yeah, it's currently a renaissance in hammock design, if you're to believe Kickstarter. Uh, so these are the things you can do. Um, for a non-astronomy event, yeah. I highly recommend going and watching a rocket launch. Mm, mm -hmm. So if you've got some time and you want to do a road trip, find out when an upcoming launch is happening from either Cape Canaveral on the on the East Coast, or from Vandenberg, which is on the West Coast, they're both are launching now very regularly, thanks yes. to SpaceX. Um, we're seeing like, at the time of this recording, the next Falcon Heavy is going to launch in just a couple of days, but but you're seeing several launches a month now. So you should be able to schedule a time that you can see one of these and it is surprisingly easy with yeah. with the East Coast with if you're out to Florida, you just there's tons of hotels down in Cocoa Beach or which is which is sort of a nice town and it's right on the beach, you can be right at the ocean and when you know this rocket launch is happening, book a hotel, drive however many hours it takes you to go there and sit and watch a rocket launch. You can do it from the beach. You can do it from a hotel while you're drinking your, your frosty beverage. Um, and it is a really civilized way to be connected. And it's not that expensive right. considering, I mean, Florida is a relatively cheap place to go. And yet for these people, rockets blasting off is their, is their backyard. Uh, some people in the chat are also mentioning wallops. So there's some launches that go from yeah. wallops, often sounding rockets and Cape Canaveral's got launches all the time. Apparently there's no launches for Vandenberg over the summer. And, and Vandenberg is a little harder because they have fog all the time. So it blocks your view to the rocket, but sometimes you'll see the rocket punch out through the top of the fog. So if, if that's a thing that you've never done, go do it, go do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, but the trick is don't book your return time. You never know how, how long a rocket is going to be delayed, but it's, it's, you know, summertime, you've got some time on your yeah. hands, you're young, you want to go for a road trip, go watch a rocket launch with a bunch of your friends. And at the same time, have fun in the coast of Orlando. Florida. Yeah. 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 And, and go to Kennedy Space Center. There's so many great things to do out there, but yeah, and watch a rocket launch. And this is the right summer to go visit all of the historic places from manned space flight, because this is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 launch and successful landing on the moon and return back to the planet Earth. And this means that there's uh, special lectures, special events, special Lego sets, yep. all out there waiting to fill your brain and take your money. So look and see what events are going on near you. You might be surprised. So many of the Apollo astronauts are still alive and uh, involved. happy to be giving talks. Yeah. Uh, so, one very special one that you might want to do is at the Fort Worth Museum of Science. Uh, our good friend, Dr. Morgan Renberg has been organizing a Apollo 50th Apollo anniversary, and he personally hand chose all of the artifacts that are going to be at this event, and he's going to be kicking around. So if you want to go and actually visit, you can go to the, um, you can go, if you're anywhere near the Dallas Fort Worth area, you should uh, drop in with Morgan. And our Good friend Nancy Atkinson has a brand new book about the Apollo flights. Go, go get it. It goes and talks about all the people behind the scenes that made things work and aren't celebrated nearly enough. So check out Nancy's book, check out what's going on near you and celebrate that two generations ago, human beings walked on the moon. And, and we might soon again, <laughs> maybe let's hope. Let's let's hope. All right. And uh, oh, go ahead. Got anything else? No, I'm all. Out. Okay, I was just gonna say for all that rainy weather, those Lego sets will keep keep you busy. So check out all the Apollo stuff that Lego has. And for those of you in the American Southwest, for those of you in Southeast Asia, waiting for monsoon season to literally rain down upon you. 
you've got Lego to keep you busy. Right. Have you got some names to read out? I do. I need to flip through to the correct screen. Uh, so for those of you who aren't watching this and have no idea why there's intermediate random chaos, uh, I am currently in Tucson, Arizona for a meeting hosted by my institution, the Planetary Science Institute. So I am doing this strictly from my laptop and my laptop is kind of tiny and is just like, why are you doing this to me? Uh, okay, so people to say thank you to, thank you for your all that you do to support us through Patreon. Uh, Robert Hoffman, Sarah Turnbull, Jessica Feltz, Holly Meyer, Margot Robinson, Chad Kalapi, Dustin Rolf, uh, Jeremy Kerwin, Joe Wilkinson, J. Alex Anderson, Brian Kelby, William Lauer, Mark Stephen Rasnick, Brent Krenop, Jack. Omar Del Riviero, William Andrews, Artho Latz Hall, Brandon Wolverton, Joshua Pearson, Anita Soar. We're going to go with that. Anti Soar? I can't tell. Uh, Tyrone Fong, Frederick Shugorg, Neuter Dude, Claudia Mastrani, and Rachel Fry. Thank you all so much for supporting us. We wouldn't be here without you. Thanks for listening. And we will see you in September. Thanks, Pamela. Bye, everyone. This is the part where we awkwardly say. Yeah. What did uh, I say? There's three, five thirty-five. I'm saved. Okay. Uh, hit us with your questions. Sir Goosey says, I'm going to miss you guys. Aw, we'll be around. We, 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 we will. We'll just be yeah. a little more flexible, a little more relaxed, a little bit more uh, not zipping around from high speed internet to high speed internet, trying to keep all the plates spinning. So it's, you can always join us on the weekly space hangout crew Slack. And uh, we both have communities for Universe Today and CosmoQuest. Um, Paul Gracie is mentioning the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas has the Apollo 13 command module on your way to Houston if you're going that cool. way. I found it by accident riding my bike across the USA in 2000. That's amazing. That's awesome. So Reels, Entropia Universe says, how do you tell the difference between a shooting star and a meteor? They're the same thing. Yeah, sorry, you broke me on that one. Yes, they're the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, and we have a whole show on this. Deep Sky we Dude, where can we share that. some of our wide field astroscapes with y'all? I took some neat photos at Texas Star Party this year. If you haven't mm -hmm. already, you should drop me an email Fraser Kane at gmail.com. And um, I, I hand over the keys to my Instagram account yeah. every day to a different astrophotographer. So yeah, so if you're on Instagram, um, please do that. Yeah, and, and if you're on Instagram, and you don't follow Universe Today already, I, I have a very small number of people I follow in universe on Instagram, because it is a place of beauty mm -hmm. and non politics. And, and Universe Today is one of these things that brings me joy. Yeah, it's great. We've featured now well over a thousand different astrophotographers. So, and I, and I just keep finding new ones to, to feature. So it's great. It feels, you know, hopefully we can, you know, we're up to whatever, 180,000, 177,000 followers on Instagram. And so we can drive tons of new followers to all of these photographers that we feature. So it feels good. Um, J 
James Amberson asks, why can't they unfurl James Webb to make sure it works before moving it to the Lagrange? I, uh, I don't think they can safely move it if it's unfurled. I, it changes the uh, moment of inertia too much. Yeah, no, it's got to it's got to be taken all the way out to the Lagrange yeah. point in one big boost, and then when it gets there, when it's just coasts to a stop up at the Lagrange point, mm -hmm. then it will unfurl everything and and get to work. So. Brainiac in five. I've always wondered, Fraser Kane, have you ever been called Fraser Crane by people from the TV show Fraser? Yes, I have. Oh, yes. the Wikipedia debacle. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you, you were not the first person to think of that. And my hope had been that I was just going to outlive the show. I mean, I had the name first. And right. every now and then I keep asking Kelsey Grammer to give me my name back. Um, and uh but apparently they're rebooting the show seriously yeah so oh, i had a beautiful moment like it was about a year ago and i was saying what well, my name was to oh someone who worked for the cleaner yeah. crew that come in and she was like i don't know what this show is i'm like yes finally <laughs> you know the young people have no idea what fraser right. is but but yeah they're bringing the show back so but over the years so so Fraser has an asteroid named after him, for which we are all very grateful. But what he doesn't have and deserves is a Wikipedia page. Yes. Because people keep saying he's a fictional human and the information is wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's not exactly why I don't have a Wikipedia well, page. I, have Wikipedia, I don't have a Wikipedia page because a really hard internet troll uh, essentially vandalized my Wikipedia page and made led a campaign for multiple i i kind of went into this a bit in the latest question show today that i released someone was saying like do you really get death threats I'm like oh yeah yeah we all get death threats pamela yeah. have you had death threats i get rape threats instead yeah yeah so um yeah yeah i know welcome to being on the internet it's just it's just the it's the part about being the internet so if anyone wants at some point feel free to fix my wikipedia page used to be that Pamela and my Wikipedia pages could be looked at side by side. They both existed. Now one doesn't and one does. And you can, but I you, don't have an asteroid. It's true. And I'll take an asteroid a thousand times over a Wikipedia page. So, um, I'm going to pout until there's an asteroid. Somebody, starts. please, some astronomer, take it upon yourself. Maybe we can like, when you you know what here's what we do when the large synoptic survey telescope uh gets cranked up and rolling use some of your programming chops to start discovering a whole bunch of asteroids oh but then you'd have to name one after yourself and that would just seem rude so so you can totally uh find any asteroid that is in a catalog and not named and propose a name for it that is a thing. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, let's see. Good Camp One says, what starter tripod would you recommend for beginner astrophotographers? Oh, they, they, change so much so for a long time celestron had a nice tracking one that wasn't too expensive um but i'm not sure what all is out there right now yeah uh, if you're in the weekly space hangout community talk to gordon if you're in the cosmoquest community talk to keeper of maps i know he has one that he's happy with and the folks at oceanside photo and telescope um they have bailed me out i don't know yeah. how many yeah. times just ask just yeah. Ask. So, so that, so that's it. That's the recommendation. So what you want, like you can use a regular camera tripod and you just want a beefy camera tripod and that's fine. Um, you can take those, like what's the longest you can take a picture before the tra stars start to trail kind of pictures. Yeah. But if you want to take it to the next level, invest in a tracking, in a tracking tripod. They're not a lot more. They're like maybe a, you, often almost the same price for a little bit more $150 maybe 
and they will track the sky. And now suddenly you can run your exposures, even with a very tight lens, you can run an exposure that's a minute long, two minutes long. So highly recommend it. And, and Pamela is exactly right. Just, just call yeah. OPT, say, I want to buy a tracking tripod and they will recommend the one that you can get. And they'll talk to you about budget and you'll find the one that you like. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Brick Kitten has a tri camera tripod that I'm currently not allowed to lift. I have something. So this, this one here, uh, I took it out to look at Jupiter, um, uh, a couple of days ago and it, you know, nearly killed me. It is just, it's such a monster heavy tripod. Yeah. So. Um, and um, Miss Brick Kitten's Instagram is like full of Lego goodness. Just to let you know. Uh, Jonathan Fortney, what's a good beginner telescope for a young teenager with a budding interest in astronomy? I'm sure about shelling out big bucks for a telescope when I'm unsure if this phase will last for her. Our answer is the same. Yeah, the Dobsonian. Dobsonian. Uh, Orion makes some nice ones. Uh, and then there's also, um, if you do want to like, do simple photography so like just your cell phone mounted on it uh there's the astronomers without borders one scope which is a beginning scope that is produced by celestron with money going to astronomers without borders yeah i would <laughs> yeah i mean it's fine like like for sure but but yeah. like i have one it's kind of like a one scope it's a little smaller yeah. let me just I've got a first scope, which is kind mm -hmm. of like the same creature, right? Right. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, what is it? A 30 millimeter. It's a, it's like a three and a half inch. Aperture. Yeah. The, the one scope's a bit bigger, yeah. but it's a similar setup. Right. You cannot hold the one scope with one hand. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see a picture of it, there's a picture of it. Oh, she's bad internet again. Um, but yeah, so I would just go for the Dobsonian, the six inch Dobsonian, uh, you can get a six inch Dobsonian for like $200. Maybe let me let me find a precise price. And it is it's just a workhorse. Um, yeah, right. So, or, like, and so Orion makes one like they all like, there's no one manufacturer that makes Dobsonian yeah. telescopes. So um, but and then you can get the XT six is theirs. You're looking at uh, $300. I wouldn't, I mean, the six inch is light, so that's okay. I'd go to the eight inch. It's more like $300 and that's the machine. So John Suffield is saying, but a Newtonian telescope for a young teen with all the problems of collimation, I'd suggest a good refractor for someone that age. Sorry. Yeah, but I mean, like I love, so like, don't get me wrong. I love a refractor. That's a refractor. And yeah, and, and, it's the cost difference for when you're getting a kid started. Yeah. And the I, aiming at a thing. I less that I think. Um, but if you're trying to figure out, is this a hobby for me? The bang for your buck of a Dobsonian is at least a factor of five of a good refracting telescope. That's an apochromatic. And in a lot of cases, you're going to be spending a couple of thousand dollars on that apochromatic refractor or $300 on a Dobsonian, $500 on yeah, a Dobsonian. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't get a an entry level refractor, but you just won't be super happy with it. I totally yeah. get that you don't have to, like this idea of collimation is the pain of a, of a Newtonian type telescope that right. you've got to tweak little screws to get the, the main mirror and the secondary mirror perfectly aligned. And there's cool tricks with lasers that you can do now to get that collimation to yeah. be done easier. But it's like one of the things that you have to do. And if you're into astronomy, it's one of the things that you will spend time doing. But, but I wouldn't go, but the, but the problem with it is it's easy to go. It's just easy to spend too much 
in the beginning, mm -hmm. and yet an eight inch Dobsonian telescope just brings so much of the universe right. into your eyeballs. And when you first buy a daub, it should already be collimated if you buy it in a store and the trip home won't knock it too far out of collimation. So you can go a while before you start to re regret your collimation yeah. and have to start internet searching how to fix it. Yes. Yeah. It's so like, like, why is it a little blurry? You know, yeah. like you won't even really care. I, yeah. I never collimated at my old, I had a, like a four inch Newtonian and I never collimated it. Right. <laughs> It just, yeah. I used it until it, until it stopped working well and I didn't know why and it didn't matter because I moved on to university. Right, so. right. That's exactly the same thing about my four inch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and now everyone's fighting, which is great, but, uh, <laughs> but it's it, like, it's tough because like, if you get one, like as a lazy old man, I love having a go-to mount that I can point at a target and let it just go. That's a beautiful thing. Um, that, and especially when you, you know, you want someone else to look through the eyepiece and you're like, and they're like, I don't see anything. You're like, Oh yeah. Okay. Hold on. And you move, you, you have to tweak the telescope to get the thing in the middle. And it, if you're in a high magnification, it's moving quickly, you know, like we've all been through this, right? And so a go-to is just the best for, yeah. for that kind of a thing, but you've got to be serious. You got to be into yeah. it to start going down that road. And then there's some, and then you can go back to the beginning and get a smaller telescope, but with a nice go-to mount, a nice small little apochromatic refractor with a nice go-to mount yeah. is a, is a thing of beauty, but. And there's plans out there for 3d printing cell phone mounts for a lot of yeah. these eyepiece brackets, which is just cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love the conversation there in, uh, in the chat about this. Yeah. So. I had to close it down so that my internet wouldn't fork. Sorry, <laughs> folks. That's funny. All right. Well, so, um, what is going to be, what's the next thing that people should be aware of that you're going to be like, I guess it's going to be us in Joshua us? tree. Yeah. So I, uh, get home from the conference that I'm at on Sunday and turn around Wednesday after doing my laundry and I'll be going out to Joshua tree and, Beyond that, I don't think I'm traveling again until August, except for personal stuff. I have no, so. I might be doing a trip with my daughter, a graduation trip with her. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, to, to Eastern Canada, but, um, but apart if from any that, of you want to do open source programming with me, that's kind of my summer plan. So <laughs> that sounds like you're fun. welcome to code with me. All right. Well, we're re coming to the end. Another reminder, go to join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Go to wshcrew.space. They will hook you up and keep you uh, entertained over the summer while we're gone. Um, but Pamela, have a great summer. I know I'm going to see you, you shortly, and I'll say this in person. But it is, again and always, an absolute pleasure and honor to work with you. Congratulations on Thank all you. the good stuff that have happened to you recently. And I look forward to hanging out and also season 12. Yes. Amazing. All right. Yes. Yeah, so Nancy Graziano is freaking out. Chloe is graduating. Yes. My daughter, the one I shared the picture of her being born in uh, universe today, all low those years ago is graduating. So yeah, it's crazy. All right. We'll see you all in two months. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.